Um, welcome tonight to American Government 101. Um, so tonight, this kind of sprang out of just a lot of questions people were having about what the government can actually do and how the government does it and how the branches interact. So we reached out to the League of Women Voters because we thought there's no better place for a nonpartisan explanation of everything that's going on. So we are thrilled to have them here today. Um, thank you so much for coming. I also want to point out in the back they have brought um, pocket constitutions for you guys. So if you didn't grab one, go ahead and grab those. Those are from the League. And all of the books in the back are available for checkout. And now I will turn it over to our presenter, Rachel Van Houten. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you guys for being here. This is a really, really nice opportunity for us. So as Aaron said, my name is Rachel Van Houten. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Larimer County. We're presenting tonight's presentation. Uh, the League has been operating since the 1920s. It was born out of the suffrage movement, the women's suffrage movement. And we are, as Aaron said, a nonpartisan citizens organization, and our goal is to improve government and engage all citizens in the issues that affect their daily lives. Okay, so we are the Larimer County chapter. We operate it uh, in all 50 states, also at the national level. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so being that this is kind of an introduction to American government, we're not going to go too deep into any one thing. But by all means, we have time for questions at the end. So please ask me those, OK? All right. So as I said, we're the League uh, of Women Voters. Kind of uh, told you a little bit about that. So why are we here tonight? Why are you guys here tonight? Well, we've seen a, a real um, increase in interest in how government works, especially since the 2016 elections. So we've seen a real increase in interest, and I, I think that's partly because this last election was just so pervasive. I mean, it it w it invaded every part of our day-to-day -day lives, and there were a lot of emotions surrounding it. Um, regardless of the outcome, it really sparked a lot of interest uh, for people who, who maybe didn't have an interest in government before, and that's really exciting. We think that's really great. Um, but I want to hear from you guys. What do you hope to learn tonight? Anybody want to venture that? No? Okay, so you just came with an open mind? That's awesome. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and jump in then. So what is civics? That's really what we're here talking about, right? Well, civics is the study of the rights and duties of citizen, citizens and how government works. Basically, it's, it's our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, Everything about civics affects us every day. The roads we drive on, um, the letters that we mail, who we vote for. It's not, it's not just about the president or um, you know, your congressman. It, it's every day. Civics affects all of us every day. So first question, does anybody want to be brave and tell me the answer to this? Do we live in a democracy? We do not, actually. That's a common misconception, but I heard somebody say no. So our system of government is a constitutional federal republic with a representative democracy. It's kind of a long explanation, but you know, it's not quite as short and sexy as a democracy, but, but that's what we live in. The difference being that in a republic, which is what we live in, you have a governing document that protects the rights of the minorities. So in a true democracy, majority rules. And that leaves a lot of people out. So we're fortunate we live in a republic where everybody has rights guaranteed, unalienable rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Speaking of which, we have the oldest written national constitution still in use today. I think that's pretty cool. No other country in the world can say that. That's amazing. And we're going to be talking mostly about government and civics at the federal level today. And the reason for that is because it's imitated at the state and local levels. But if we were to start at state and local and work up, there would be way too many exceptions. So we're going to talk mainly about federal, but we'll talk a little bit about state and local later. So let's talk about why we have the government that we have. This dude here caused a lot of problems for our founders. This is King George III. He was the ruler of England when uh, the American colonies were getting toward the tail end of being colonies and getting kind of fed up. So he was doing what a monarch does. You know, he was ruling his colonies from afar, but his parliament was really putting the screws to the colonists, charging them tar out outrageous tariffs, implementing ridiculous laws, and uh, people kind of got fed up with it. This is the Boston Tea Party, where they were objecting to tea tariffs. Here's some rioting, some more rioting and looting, and then some tarring and feathering. So basically, people were just fed up. 
And that's when our founders got together and wrote the Declaration of Independence. You can see Thomas Jefferson there. I see Ben Franklin. So they basically said, enough's enough. And July 4, 1776, that's when we get a signed Declaration of Independence. And basically what this was was the founders and the colonies saying, enough. You have just ruined our lives, basically. We're not going to live under a tyrant anymore, and we're done. Oh, I kind of cut off at the bottom there. But it wasn't until June of 1787 that we actually got our Constitution, which is what we live under today. So speaking of the Constitution, I'm not going to go too in-depth in that because I would really encourage you guys to come back to next week's talk on the Constitution. That's going to be really great. So the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are called the Bill of Rights. And these are concerned mostly with our individual liberties. But even then, partisan divide is nothing new. Don't be fooled. This goes back to the beginning of our country. There were the Federalists who believed in a stronger central government and the Anti-Federalists who believed in stronger independent governments. So the Constitution, the very first thing the Constitution does is addresses the separation of powers. Because the founders were obsessed with never living under a tyrant again. And they didn't want any one group to have all the power ever again. So they built our Constitution to be strong and robust. And this was the first thing they did. So we have three branches in our government. We have the legislative, which that is the first one that the Constitution lists out. The executive, and then judicial. So it lists it in this order. We're going to start with the legislative. This is the capital in DC. So this is comprised of Congress. 435 representatives in the House of Representatives, 100 senators in the Senate. So these are the people that make our laws. That's why they're called lawmakers. They approve presidential appointments. As you probably saw over the last couple of months, the Senate was approving President Trump's appointments. And they are direct, directly elected by you and me. Congress can declare war. This is the executive branch. And as you probably recognize, this is the White House. This is comprised of the president, vice president, and the cabinet. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. The executive branch is the branch that signs laws that Congress passes. It can also veto laws. And they pardon people, appoints federal judges, and commands the armed forces. Even though Congress declares war, it's the executive branch that commands the armed forces. Lastly is the judicial branch. And this is the Supreme Court building. So this is comprised of the Supreme Court and lower federal courts. This is the branch that rules if laws are unconstitutional. Technically, any law can be passed and signed into law, or any bill can be passed and signed into law. But it's up to the judicial branch to say if that's constitutional or not. They are appointed by the president, and the Supreme Court can overturn rulings by lower courts. There are nine Supreme Court justices in a full bench, and for about a year, we were missing one. We only had eight, but they were still able to function. And Supreme Court justices do enjoy a lifetime appointment. So we talked about the separation of powers. Now we're going to talk about how those powers interact with each other. And this was another thing that the founders did to ensure that no one group had too much power, was they, they implemented these checks and balances. So each branch has very specific ways that they can keep the other two branches in check. The legislative branch has the most number of checks, and that probably goes along with the fact that they were the first one to be named, and they have the most detail in the Constitution, while the judicial has the fewest number of checks. But that doesn't mean that any one branch is better than the other or more powerful than the other. And we talked about the Supreme Court justices. So this graphic kind of shows us what these checks and balances look like. You've got the legislative up top, executive, and judicial. And we can see things like the legislative branch keeps the judicial branch in check by impeaching Supreme Court justices or rejecting appointments to the Supreme Court. The executive branch keeps the legislative branch in check by vetoing their bills and can adjourn Congress if they so choose, if, if the president so chooses. Judicial branch, as I talked about, can declare actions and, and laws unconstitutional, and then they are no longer in effect. So you can see here, to me, this is just the beauty of, of our system and how we don't want anyone to be too powerful. Because then what, what do we risk? We risk falling right back into what we had with King George. Sure. So the question was, when and why would the executive branch adjourn Congress if they wanted to, if the president wanted to stall what was going on? They could do that. I don't know that there's been an adjournment recently. 
um, at least not in this president's term. There are lots of rules surrounding, so um, Congress uses what's called parliamentary procedure. These are the rules of debate, and both houses use it, and there are some really specific timelines and rules on what you can and can't do, and rather than guessing, I'm gonna get you an accurate answer so we can tell you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about elections, because we just had a big one. The different types of elections, we have a primary. Everybody familiar with that? So in an open primary, this is where voters aren't locked into a particular party. This is not what we have here in Colorado. We have a closed primary, which means you have to declare a political party before you can vote in that party's primary. In some states, you don't have to declare a party and you can still vote in the primary, but you can only vote for one party, one candidate. It did, yep, we're gonna talk about that, good call. And then there is a runoff voting. This is if no one gets enough votes, it's called instant runoff voting. So we don't actually enjoy that here in Colorado, but I know that League does have a position on that, so we can do some more research on that. And then there's the general election. Uh, local elections, this would be like your mayor, your city council person, sheriff, that kind of thing. And then special elections. Um, I live in Loveland and we just had one of these because one of our city council members was actually elected to the House of Representatives leaving a vacant seat, so we had to have a special election in March to fill that seat. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about primaries. What this does is narrows the field down to one candidate per party, and we saw a really good example of this in the 2016 Republican presidential primary, where it started out with 17 candidates. 17 people wanted to be the Republican nominee, and it got narrowed down to one during the primary season. So the primary Elections are executed at the state level, and dates and methods vary. So in the presidential primary, primary season starts in like January and doesn't end until June in some states. Now, by that point, we pretty much know who the nominee is gonna be, but we still have those primaries. And then, does they, so you kind of touched on this, but does anybody know what a caucus is? Anybody familiar with a caucus? In the 2016 election, we still had a caucus, but voters decided they wanted to go back to primaries, so every election, from this point forward, every presidential election will be a primary. The difference between a caucus and a primary is a caucus is basically getting together with your neighbors and voting. There are no ballots, no official ballots. It's not run by the state or the county. They're really run more by parties. And from personal experience, they can feel kind of unorganized because you get a lot of people in a very small space Everybody wants to talk, and it can just feel like, I, it is, it absolutely is. But I think that people get frustrated a little bit. When I went to, when I caucused last year, I heard people come out and say, gosh, why did I even come to this? I don't really feel like I did anything. I loved going because like you said, that was democracy in action and that, would, that really gets my blood going. But for some people, it turned them off to voting and that's unfortunate. So what, the, what Colorado voters decided in 2016 was they'd rather go back to a primary. I don't know if people would just prefer that paper ballot, like it feels more official to them, or they want more time to vote rather than just one evening. Because if, if it doesn't work with your schedule that you can't go caucus, you don't get to vote in the primary, and that's kind of a bummer. So my hope is that by going back to a primary, more people will get involved in voting that way as we said here, yep. So from 2003 to 2016, we had caucuses, and now we're gonna go back to primaries. So in the general election, this is where there's only one candidate per party. Many states do align their state and local elections with national ones, but they don't have to. This is why you can have elections in March, in November. It's really up to the jurisdiction. And the presidential election day is the same day everywhere. But it's not just candidates in the general election. I just talked about the fact that we voted to go back to primaries. That was in the general election. We also deal with propositions, amendments at the state level, tax increases, judges. You find all that on your ballot. So the Electoral College. This was a pretty big deal in 2016. Caused a lot of confusion. So let's talk about this. So the original purpose of the Electoral College was the founders just didn't really trust that the people could choose their own president. Sad but true. But it's morphed into a more modern purpose, and that's that it does give smaller and swing states a shot. And we'll talk about that. 
So electors are apportioned based on the number of legislators they have in their state. So each state gets one elector per senator and one elector per representative. So we have two senators in Colorado and seven representatives. So how many electoral votes do we get? Nine, exactly. There are 538 total because Washington DC, even though they don't have representatives, representatives or senators, they still get electoral votes, they get three. And who are they? They're typically people who are loyal to the party. And you need 270 to win, which is a simple majority. So that's half the number of available electoral votes plus one. 48 of our states are winner take all and Nebraska and Maine are the exception. They can split up their electoral votes because that's the beauty of states' rights. They have the right to do that. And only five times in our history has a candidate become president after losing the popular vote. The most recent of which was 2016. And this at the bottom here talks about faithless electors. And what that is is somebody who is an elector for their party and they go, the, sorry, they go to the opposite party. It's not that common. It does happen. Not enough to turn the tide of an election. OK, so let's take a look at a map here. You might recognize this. This is the most recent election. President Trump got 306 electoral votes, Hillary Clinton 232. However, these were the popular vote totals. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by almost 3 million. So how did she lose the Electoral College? Let's take a look here. See all these red states? Well, they may not have very many electoral votes on their own, but you add all those up together, and that's a pretty significant voting block. Now, some of these swing states like Florida, if Florida had flipped the other way, she would have had a much better chance. Pennsylvania, which actually voted for Barack Obama in 2012. Ohio, same thing. Michigan, Wisconsin. All of those flipped from traditionally Democratic states to Republican. And combining with the other traditional Republican states gave Donald Trump enough of a boost to win the presidency. Sure. So when you vote for a president, technically you're not voting for the president. You're voting for that president's party that they represent. So in this case, Hillary Clinton did take Colorado. So they come out and say, Hillary Clinton won Colorado, won the popular vote in Colorado. She gets all of the Democratic electors. And those go in her bank. However, in Texas, Donald Trump won the popular vote in Texas, and he gets 38 in his bank. And so then the election's not really over in November. So then December comes. And that's when all of the electors come together and they get to cast their votes. So yes, for each state, there are a set of electors for the Republicans and a set of electors for the Democrats. So basically the uh, Republican electors from Colorado, they get a set of steak knives, they get to go home. So it's the Democrats from, the Democratic electors from Colorado, they actually get to go cast their ballot at the Capitol in Denver. They cast theirs. Each state's governor then sends their set of votes to Congress, everything's verified. And then we have an inauguration. So the question was, if there are nine electors in Colorado, do they have to go all blue or all red, essentially? Why does the party matter? The reason being that there are actually two sets per state. There are nine Democratic electors in Colorado, nine Republican electors. And whoever, whichever candidate wins that state gets those electors. They get to cast their vote. Sure. So the question was, if, if there are states with laws against being a faithless elector, why does the party matter? Why can't you just go with the nine electors regardless. And I think you bring up a really good question that's been happening a lot more lately is why do we even have the Electoral College? <laughs> what purpose does it serve? I can tell you from my point of view, the purpose of the Electoral College is so that these states in the middle here that are unkindly referred to as the flyover states, you've probably heard that term before, um, they still get a voice. Because individually, they don't have very many electoral votes, right? They have, Nebraska has five, South Dakota has three. But by the way, the minimum number you can have is three because every state has two senators and at least one representative. So my home state of Wyoming, we still get three electoral votes even though we have just over half a million people in the entire state. So that would be my answer to that is because it still gives those states a voice. So in this case, you know, it could be argued, what happened here? Well, I would say that the, the Democratic campaign maybe didn't appeal to those states very much. And this is how they showed that. But you know, I don't think there's really an easy answer to that because that's what people are asking themselves a lot now. 
because we've seen this twice in our lifetime, twice in the last 17 years. All right, so we're gonna look at the other time this has happened in our lifetime, and that was the 2000 election. This was much closer. George W. Bush, President George W. Bush got 271, which is just one over the minimum number of electoral votes you need, and Gore got 266. But in this case, the popular vote was much closer than in the 2016 election. Gore got just shy of 51 million, Bush got 50,456,002, just over half a million votes different. This actually prompted a Supreme Court case, Bush v. Gore. So again, Florida was a swing state, and that's what it came down to. So there was a lot of attention paid to Florida that year, right? Hanging chads, pregnant chads, I don't really remember. So the question is, can we, can we count on the concept of one person, one vote? I think that really still goes along with the question of why do we have the Electoral College? Um, I mean, in all seriousness, you, bring up, you both bring up really good points, and this is what people are talking about. And if you feel strongly about something, I would encourage you to reach out to your, your legislators. I mean, I don't, I don't know that they're gonna wanna change it, but enough people, enough people get hot about something, we can, we can change the way our society is. Okay, so let's talk about voting for a second. You can vote in the United States if you are a legal U.S. citizen, 18 years or older. You must not be serving a sentence of confinement, detention, or parole for a felony conviction. So if you were convicted of a felony and you're still on parole, you just have to wait until you, you're, you're off parole. And then you can go back to voting. Okay, so common misconception that if you've committed a felony, you can no longer vote, and that's just not true. You just have to... In Colorado, yeah, you just have to wait until your parole is up. Um, that may not be the same in other states. Other states may be more restrictive, but here in Colorado, uh, as soon as you're off parole, yeah, you can, you can vote again. And uh, it's not affected by misdemeanors. You commit a misdemeanor, it doesn't do anything to your voting. Um, Colorado is a very voter-friendly state, one of the friendliest I've seen. You can register to vote up to and including on election day at the polls. You can have never registered to vote in Colorado. You can go to the polls and register right then and vote. It's pretty amazing. We have two weeks of early voting. We have mail-in ballots. One thing I wanna say about electioneering, anybody familiar with this concept? So when you go to the polls, you can't campaign for any candidates or any propositions or ballot measures. You can't voice your preference. Get in, vote quietly, get your sticker and go, and you won't be guilty of electioneering. It, it, it is illegal. I think it would probably depend on you know, what how severe they wanted to, to treat it. The question being, what happens if you are caught electioneering? I think that most likely they would probably escort you out, possibly a fine. You could get ticketed, it, it, it would depend. Yeah, I mean, good rule of thumb, don't do it. <laughs> cover up your shirt, they might actually, has anybody ever been asked to like cover up a campaign t-shirt when you go to the polls? No, I've seen it. I've been an election judge a couple times and they'll, they'll actually ask you to cover that up because you don't wanna be trying to influence an election, right? Because we have free and fair elections. I love this cartoon. This is great. So this, this represents about a third of eligible voters actually vote on a regular basis. One third. And the other two thirds, why not? Eh, we won't make a difference. My vote doesn't count. All of them together, it sure could. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how bills become laws. So it can be a pretty complicated process, but I'm gonna to try to break it down to the bare essentials. Um, so a legislator will introduce a bill to either the House or the Senate. I know here in Colorado, uh, legislators are limited to five bills per session. They can only introduce up to five per session. Uh, then it's assigned to a committee. If the committee approves that bill, then it goes to the General Assembly for discussion and voting. Let's assume that this passes General Assembly in the House just fine. Next, it would go to the Senate for the same process. Let's say it goes through Senate committee, great, Senate loves it, they pass it, and then it goes, once it's identically approved in both chambers, then it goes to the president's desk. Say the president loves it, signs it, becomes law. However, president doesn't love it, he vetoes it, then it goes back to the legislature, let's say, or back to Congress, let's say they really wanted to get this bill into law. It takes a two-thirds vote to override that presidential veto. Yep. You mean if it makes it out of committee and all that and it goes to the floor? I'm not really familiar with that process because even though he's the Senate Majority Leader, I don't know that he could. Jane, yeah? 
So the question being that are there checks, essentially are there checks and balances within the chambers on the majority leader? Um, sounds like the answer is not necessarily in that sense, but it could be political. It, it could backfire politically if they were too tyrannical. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, they're all kind of intermingled. Okay, so Congress, bicameral, meaning two houses. So we have Congress is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Senators are in the Senate, representatives are in the House, and they're all... House of Representatives, Senate is the Senate. Correct. But they're both called houses. Yeah, chambers. Chambers. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that may be a little confusing. Um, and then we can also call them um, lawmakers, legislators, that kind of thing. It could be like if if a if a Senate working, sorry, if a senator wanted to introduce it, and it went through the whole approval process, then it would have to go to the House for approval. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, you know, if the if the president vetoes it, what would the two thirds vote look like, and it would be in both chambers. Yep, yeah, there are kill committees even at the Colorado State Legislature. They can strategically put a bill that that the, um, the majority doesn't majority leadership wouldn't want to have passed, they can put it in a kill, kill committee knowing that it's probably not gonna make it out. Yeah, by changing the rules of, of debate. Yeah, you're right, and we saw that when, right, with the filibuster and the going nuclear, yeah, what that is is they, so we're gonna talk a little bit about filibusters, but the rules were actually changed in the Senate that you wouldn't need as many people in opposition to that filibuster to make it end. They lowered the number they went nuclear. So they could end a filibuster a lot easier. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there are mechanisms within Congress to do those things, and, and that's kind of where the politics come in as well. I mean, the, the people who get elected to Congress are very good at politicking. You know, they, they, know, they know the rules inside and out, and, and they, they use them, because that's what they're there for, yeah. So the, the president of the Senate is actually the vice president, yeah. The vice president will preside over the Senate when needed. The Senate majority leader um, is, is just like the head honcho of whatever party is in the majority. I would say probably the most uh, visible person in the House would be the Speaker of the House. That is the person who presides over the House of Representatives. They're elected within their own, they're chosen within their group. Right within the majority party, the ruling party in the House of Representatives, yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions on this? That's true. Then we also have minority leaders. We have minority whips, which if anybody watches House of Cards, no. Kevin Spacey's character is the minority whip or the majority whip, and they're the person who makes sure all the rules are followed and basically whips everybody into shape. I don't know if that's why that's what it's called. but um, Okay, so here's kind of a good graphic that shows what we just talked about. Uh, the bill we were discussing starts in the House of Representatives, goes to committee, yes, no, let's say everybody loves it, it's approved, and then you can see over here it goes over to the Senate to do the whole thing again, and then it comes down and goes to the President's desk, and it can either be vetoed or signed into law. There are a lot more details that go into it, you know, the old joke of laws are like sausages, you don't want to know how they're made. Yeah, go ahead. No, they are established. So the, the question was uh, on, about committees. Are they established from the beginning or are they ad hoc as a bill comes out? No, they're established. Um, I believe that in Colorado we have seven. Don't quote me on that. Um, but they're established for very specific purposes and, and they come back year after year after year. So, That's right. Sometimes um, the majority leaders who uh, apportion the bills can be creative <laughs> with where a bill goes, and that's what we were just talking about with a kill committee. Um, a bill may get sent to the quote unquote kill committee, and you may say, why? But they've obviously found some way to get that over there, so yes. All right, so now we're, we've talked a lot about federal. We're gonna go on to state and local government. The 10th Amendment, which is the last amendment in the, in the Bill of Rights, states the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution not prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This is the state's rights amendment. This is how I talked about how Nebraska and Maine can choose to split up their electors. That's because of the 10th Amendment. They have the right to do that. States do have a certain level of autonomy and control over local governments. However, state laws, no matter how autonomous they are, can't violate the U.S. Constitution because the U.S. Constitution is still the law of the land. 
Okay, this does typically mirror the structure of US government. We see that with the Colorado House and Senate, same structure as uh, at, at the federal level of, of Congress. Still have legislative, executive, judicial branches. Executive branch in this case would be the governor, lieutenant governor, judicial branches. We have judges at all levels of government. Some of the things that state governments are in charge of, transportation, public health and environment, Board of Education, regulatory agencies, Veterans Affairs, Criminal Justice, Parks and Wildlife, Motor Vehicles, these are all state agencies. There are 210 regulation departments and agencies in Colorado alone. 210. They regulate just about anything you could think of. Hairdressers are regulated in the state of Colorado. We talked about this elected officials governor, lieutenant governor, our state legislator, secretary of state, and attorney general. Okay, now we move on to local government. This is usually broken down into counties and municipalities. That's what we see in Colorado, but other states have parishes, boroughs, townships. Again, that's the beauty of states' rights. There's no you know, one set of vocabulary you have to use. Local government is granted their powers by the state because we have to adhere to the state constitution, which has to adhere to the U.S. constitution. Some of the things that, oh, sorry, that should say local governments are in charge of, parks and rec, transportation, public works, housing, municipal courts, police and fire services, and libraries. Elected officials, county commissioner, clerk, sheriff, coroner, your mayors, your city council members. And this can also include, uh, local government can also include school districts, health districts, fire protection districts, and the like. You mean how Virginia is actually a commonwealth? What's the difference between a commonwealth and a state? Um, no. <laughs> no, because that's so far removed from what we have out here. I, I don't have a lot of information on that. I believe that they have all the same rights of a state as a state, and we are 50 states, so. It's probably more than a matter of semantics, but I would have to look into that. All right, so these are some words that you may have heard in current events recently. Executive order. This has been kind of a big one since January 20th, right? President Trump has been signing some pretty high-profile executive orders. Anybody want to take a guess on what this means? So this is how the executive branch can actually put something into law without having to go through Congress. President can sign an executive order, and unless it's ruled unconstitutional, it's law. So you kind of, you're in the conundrum of, do I want this to become law really quickly, or do I want it to be law permanently? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, filibuster. So we talked a little bit about this. This is something that can only happen in the Senate. And this is where if um, a senator or a group of senators are really opposed to a bill or really in favor of a bill, they can stand up and speak for hours, days, until they collapse basically, or until they're overruled by a, a larger group of senators, which now it's, it's 51, uh, getting together and, and putting a halt to it. The cabinet, what's the president's cabinet? Top level advisors, that's right. So this is the um, Secretary of State, Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of Education, that kind of stuff. So this is what we, we slogged through all of the confirmation hearings for President Trump's cabinet picks. Closed session. So this is something that doesn't happen a ton. Let me back up a bit. Everything that your elected representatives do should be a matter of public record. You should be able to find that easily if you know where to look unless it happens in a closed session. So if Congress goes into a closed session, and this can happen independently in the House of Representatives and the Senate, anything that happens in there is secret, not a matter of public record, unless, unless they vote to release it. It is secret. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's our, it's our right and our duty to keep tabs on what our legislators are doing. Congressional Review Act, has anybody heard about this? This has kind of come up in the first part of, of 2017. Anybody familiar with this? Sure, so this is something where Congress can overturn legislation from the previous session. They, have to, they can only go back 60 legislative days, but this has been happening quite a bit in the current session, um, undoing a lot of things that happened during uh, Obama's administration. Yeah, it's, it's year round, but they're not always in session. 
That sounds about right, because when they're not in session, they're typically back in their home state, you know, meeting with their constituents and, and doing stuff uh, in their state. I can tell you that here in Colorado, our legislative session runs from January to May 10th. So it just ended. So it's kind of six of one, half dozen the other. Either they're in D.C. all the time, they don't get to talk to their constituents, or they're home a lot and they don't get to interact with their, with their colleagues and work through some things. So I think we're currently in the 115th legislative session, if I remember right. Just just started in. And, well, sorry, a session is actually two years. All right, so NATO. This was in the news recently, right? So this stands for the North Atlantic. I always forget the acronym. Oh, I'll see you guys now. I didn't have to cover this. So, all right. Somebody tell me what it does. Yeah, yeah, Western Europe and um, Canada and the United States, I believe. Yeah, it's basically a military alliance. We kind of watch each other's back. And NAFTA, again, in the news, President Trump wanted to repeal, do away with NAFTA. This is the North American Free Trade Act. So what this does is basically releases a lot of tariffs between North American countries, Canada, U.S., and Mexico to ease trade, to promote trade a little bit more. Okay? Questions? That's true, but legalized marijuana still doesn't mean it's legal. It's just accepted. Yeah, it's decriminalized, and the Obama administration made the choice to not pursue that. Now, that could flip the other way with the Trump administration if they felt really strongly about it. Right, so I think you're definitely on the right track in that if, if the Trump administration wanted to make that a priority, then it would end up going to the Supreme Court, sure. And that's when the state of Colorado could say, uh, but Tenth Amendment, you know, or whatever else, or whatever amendment they thought it fell under, yeah, that would be for the, for the courts to decide, absolutely. So you bring up kind of an interesting point, and that's um, that senators and representatives at the national level don't have term limits. They don't have term limits. They can run as many times as they want. They can be elected as many times as, as the people will keep electing them. And what uh, Mitch, Senator Mitch McConnell said recently when the idea of term limits was brought up, he said, we have term limits. They're called elections. Um, so that's, that's where the, the people's power is. And it's a tough choice because you know the role of a, of a representative and a, and a senator at the national level is to fight for their state's uh, advancement, right? To, to fight for... Uh, as much for their state as they can. That's true, but the, the responsibility they have to their constituents to get reelected, that, that's what they're... Sure, absolutely. So the question was, can we go over executive orders again? So an executive order is basically what it sounds like. It comes from the executive branch and it's an order that becomes law without having to go through Congress. Yes, the judicial branch is what can check the executive branch in that instance. Another way besides an executive order being brought before the judicial branch to determine if it's constitutional is that if the executive order requires funding, then the House would have to approve funding in order for it to happen. I know that when an executive order is signed, it does have an effective date, so it may not go into effect right away, but it could be... Um, you know, the next fiscal year or whenever. So yeah, they don't, they don't necessarily go into effect right away. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at it, that that could be seen as a, as a check against the legislative branch. If they're just not getting anything done, then the, the president can go ahead and do that. But they would only have 60 legislative days to get that done. And, and, and that's what we're seeing now, is that the, the current um, Congress is, is undoing quite a few Obama era and, and that, that can create a lot of instability because, you know, we, we have a, a Republican president now. If the next administration were to be Democratic, they could undo. Thing. It's just, it's not, it's not good for the country to constantly be ping-ponging back and forth. So that's exactly what I was talking about, the, the struggle for every elected official to get as much as he or she can for their state to take home to their constituents. That's, that's where a lot of earmarking and pork spending comes in. The, the question was, at one point, Weld County wanted to secede and become the 51st state. Yeah, there was some truth that, th that there was a campaign for that. And that's not the first. There have been multiple campaigns in, in our history, and they'd never go anywhere. For secession, sure. Well, West Virginia seceded from Virginia, so I guess that happened. But, um, well, yeah. <laughs> the biggest example being the Civil War. <laughs> that didn't work either. <laughs> Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands, they can vote. Mm-hmm. They don't have representation in Congress, but, but they can vote. Um, no. 
No, but they have popular vote. That's honestly, in Puerto Rico, that's a question that's been going on for a long time. And it comes down to the people of Puerto Rico. If they want to be an official part of the U.S. or they want to you know, stay in the um, arrangement that they have. Well, thank you guys so much for coming.